Okay, uh, it's 7.03 and I will call to order this uh, special meeting of the Mount Pleasant City Commission this Tuesday, March 2nd, 2021. And uh, we can stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. And Chris, can you take the roll? Absolutely. Um, and this is our practice during the pandemic. Each commissioner will need to give their city, county, and state where they're located. Uh, Mayor Joseph? Uh, I am in the city of Mount Pleasant, Isabella County, in the state of Michigan. Uh, Vice Mayor Pershbacher. Uh, City of Mount Pleasant, County, Isabella, State, Michigan. Commissioner Alsager. City of Mount Pleasant, County, Isabella, State of Michigan. Uh, Commissioner Simon. Uh, State of Michigan, Isabella County, um, Mount Pleasant. Thank you. Commissioner Gillis. Mount Pleasant, Isabella, Michigan. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ronan. City of Mount Pleasant, County of Isabella, the state of Michigan. Thank you. And Commissioner Tolis. City of Mount Pleasant, County of Isabella, State of Michigan. Uh, Mr. Mayor, roll has been taken and all are present. Okay. Thank you, Chris. Um, do we have any additions or deletions to the agenda tonight? Okay. Seeing none, um, re we have a receipt of petitions and communications. Manager Ridley. We don't have any petitions and communications tonight, Mayor. Okay. And at this time, uh, we will go into our uh, work session. We have a training on parliamentary procedure at Robert's Rules of Order uh, meeting procedures. And I'll hand it over to Nancy Ridley, our city manager, to introduce our guests tonight. Thank you, Mayor. Um, tonight we have with you Connie DeFord and Connie's um, career was in local government and she served as the municipal clerk in Bay City, Michigan. She also was president of the Michigan Municipal Clerks Association and was elected city clerk of the year at one point. And she also was recipient of the Quill Award from the International Institute of Municipal Clerks and the Award of Merit from the Michigan Municipal League. And to um, show her qualifications even more so, she was also past president of the National Association of Parliamentarians and the National Association of Parliamentarians Educational Foundation and served as the president of the Michigan State Association of Parliamentarians and the Michigan Unit of Registered Parliamentarians. So obviously she comes to us well versed and well um, from a lot of leadership positions and I'm sure has run a meeting or two of her own. Um, so with that, she does have a PowerPoint presentation and I will turn it over to Connie and she will talk to you about how she wants to handle questions as well. So Connie, right. take it away. Thank you so much. I want to express my appreciation to uh, your city manager for contacting me and for you for arranging this special meeting work session uh, for training in parliamentary procedure. Uh, Nancy provided a number of documents to me, um, chapter 30 of your code of ordinances regarding your meetings, um, the agenda format and the policy on agenda setting, um, electronic participation procedure, minutes of some meetings during the past year, and links to YouTube videos, which I did watch um, to see how your meetings are handled and um, what I might garner as far as information to provide this um, information to you uh, so that it's meaningful to your community. Um, as Nancy mentioned, I was the municipal clerk in Bay City and when they offered an early out after my 27 years of service, I flew out that window and took up uh, the parliamentary procedure aspect of my life, which I had been preparing for. I've been a uh, professional registered parliamentarian since 1989. And we have to be recertified every six years, um, establish that we have been active in the field and uh, also go through some face-to-face uh, -face three days of training. 
So um, I'm good now till 2025. So I'm still within that six year time frame. So with that, um, tonight with the questions, I will um, put up the participants window um, to see if you raise your hand if you have a question. Um, if you have a question, please don't hesitate to indicate that by, by that raise hand feature. And I will ask, or Nancy will, someone will get to you to ask what your question might be. If it's something pertinent to what I'm discussing at that time, I'll go ahead and answer it. Because there um, is usually, if one person has a question, other people also have a question about that same thing. So I will try to be um, efficient as far as our time. I would say the worst time to present parliamentary procedure is right after lunch. I'm not sure if right after the dinner hour is better or not, but here we are. So with that, I'll ask Chris to load the, par the PowerPoint. You also received some items um, from me. You might have received a little 10 question questionnaire. We'll go over that a little later and a pamphlet that's produced by the National Association of Parliamentarians. And with that, I will be talking about some of those things along the way as we do the presentation. <clears throat> and Chris, can you do the um, slide presentation from the beginning? Uh, yeah, we'll give you one second. Sure. I've got multiple screens and it's, I think it's trying to share the wrong <laughs> screen. Okay. There, is that showing up properly for you guys? Not yet, there it is. So we go to that second screen. I always like to know what is going to be covered. If I attend any kind of a training program, I like to know what kinds of things are going to be discussed. Kind of gets me in that preparation mode uh, to listen to it. So I'm gonna talk a little bit tonight about the evolution of parliamentary procedure. It didn't just happen, it has evolved over centuries. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, some basic rules um, that pertain to all kinds of meetings, uh, governing documents and how they have a hierarchy for pr processing different kinds of motions. The steps in handling a motion and different types of motions. Uh, what Robert's Rules of Order says about business in small boards, which are no more than about a dozen so you are about right for that. And some of those things you're using, some you may wish to use, some you may wish to discard completely, but we'll talk about all of those. And then some commonly misunderstood motions. So let's get started with the evolutionary process. So even before recorded history, decisions had to be made. Who is going to be the leader? What job would each person do? What and when to hunt and where to live? All of those kinds of decisions had to be made. The decisions we make now are usually contained within meetings, but prior to that recorded history, there were still decisions being made and someone had to lead and there had to be some acquiescence to an agreement for what they were going to do, either that or they would be off on their own. Next, please. So the Greek city-states of Athens and Sparta actually had a bicameral system, much as we do in our state legislature and in the United States legislature with two houses. They were the first ones to establish what a quorum was. Um, so that term comes from the, the Greek for those necessary to be present in order to conduct a meeting. They voted by a show of hands, which is actually what they do in Canada. The, the main way that they take their votes in meetings in Canada is by show of hands. And it is allowed under Robert's Rules of Order as well. And the Greeks also decided things by a majority vote. So they had to have agreement with, within those two um, systems about 
what was going to happen and both by a majority vote. The Roman Empire also had two houses, a Senate and a Comitia, maybe the forerunner of our commission like you are, commissioners. Um, that was the first record of a filibuster. Uh, the Senate has changed their rules uh, in recent years, so the filibuster isn't quite as prominent as it used to be. But um, the filibuster that was recorded in the Roman Empire history was regarding an agricultural issue. So it was uh, one of those hot topics that we get sometimes, and they talked about it for a long time. One of the other things that was um, included for the first time is a division of the assembly. So when a vote would be taken, and it was impossible to know if it was those in favor or though opposed, they actually divided the assembly. Those that were in favor went to one side and those that were opposed went to the other, and then they counted them. This was much better than whoever was loudest, which is sometimes what was done, because the way we say the words makes a difference in the volume that is expressed. If we use the, the normal vo viva voce by the voice vote, I and no, I is kind of up in that upper register. It's not quite as um, demanding as no, it's much louder. So if you're ever in a very large assembly and the vote is taken by vote by voice, it's very easy for the negative to be much louder than the affirmative. And the way that we do that now is you can still ask for a division, which then would require a rising vote. You don't have to deal with that because you have um, the vote by roll call. Moving along in England and the English Parliament, much of what we have in parliamentary procedure comes from that English Parliament. You'll notice that their seating is different than ours. Um, they um, are seated across from each other. And um, when I toured the um, House of Commons in Canada for the Canadian uh, Parliament, um, they said that those seats are more than two swords away from each other. So even if they each got out their sword, they could not reach the other party. So um, that, but it's a little bit different configuration than what we have. Uh, the English Parliament established considering just one subject at a time, so limiting what could be discussed, and alternating between those in favor and those opposed, that pro and con. They also confined debate to the merits of the pending question, so it really narrowed down what could be discussed, only that one subject, pro and con, and then confine that debate to the merits of was it a good idea or not. In the United States and the Continental Congress, each of the 13 colonies had one vote. Delegates were limited to speaking twice on a topic on a day. So there was some limitation as to their freedom to discuss. Items could be postponed. And actually delegates held secret meetings, which would be the precursor to our in-camera or executive sessions. So even back then, uh, they were uh, using that possibility of meeting for certain reasons without be being a public meeting. The first manual of parliamentary procedure for the United States was written by Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Jefferson's manual is still available. If you contact your local congressman, you can get a copy of it. It's still in publication. Um, the Senate uh, used it when Jefferson was vice president and presiding officer for the Senate. House of Representatives also adopted the manual, but of course they made some changes in it. And it has been amended over the years to suit the purposes and situations of those individual legislative bodies. So they operate under different sets of rules. But um, it was the first manual in this country about parliamentary procedure. Uh, actually, a um, 
clerk of the Massachusetts House of Representatives thought in 1845, um, some 40 years after Jefferson's manual, well, if, if they can do it in the legislature, in the United States legislature, shouldn't there be some kind of framework for ordinary organizations? Um, even then, the United States was full of people who joined groups or organizations, societies, um, associations, uh, either because of, and we still do, because of our vocation or because of our avocations or because of our public service or because we want to be of service to our communities. Um, that has not changed. But in Cushing's manual, he just said, you need rules about these things, but he didn't give any advice about what those rules might be. He thought that each organization, each society could decide for themselves. <clears throat> and that was um, an undertaking that not many achieved. <clears throat> Henry Robert was an Army Corps of Engineers, um, eventually a general. Um, he was, um, had, um, been ill and in 1863 was stationed in New Bedford, Massachusetts. He was in uniform and attended a town hall meeting as they still do in New England um, about what would happen if, remember we're talking about during the Civil War, what would uh, the town do if they were invaded by, um, by sea by an army from the South or Navy from the South, I guess it would be. The meeting was 14 hours long. Um, they needed someone to preside over that meeting, didn't have anyone to do it and asked him if he would. He, as I said, he was in uniform, had a certain dignity about him. And he said he trusted divine providence that they would behave. Guess what, they didn't. And he resolved that he would never again put himself in that type of situation until he had written down some basic rules of procedure. He went from there to San Francisco where the melting pot, um, where everyone was coming there from different states with different ideas about what the rules should be for organizations. So whoever was running the organization used the rules they were familiar with from their home state and might not be different from others. Um, it was when he was stationed in Green Bay, Wisconsin in a terrible winter that he had time to write his rules out in a manual. He called it the Pocket Manual of Rules of Order for Deliberative Assemblies. The publisher said it doesn't fit and the publisher named it Robert's Rules of Order. Um, it was self-published and no one would publish it for him. He ordered 4,000 copies um, and mailed out a thousand of them and then thought the 3000 would last two or three years. He was sold out in four months. So there was a real need and a thirst for that knowledge about how to handle parliamentary procedure. The um, current edition of Robert's Rules of Order, newly revised, is the 12th edition. Um, about now, every 10 years, the authorship team comes out with a, an upgrade to the book. Um, this latest one has a lot to do with uh, online meetings, meeting virtually. Uh, before the last edition, the 11th edition in, in 2010, didn't have much about online meetings. But as you know, and with the pandemic, we all know, how handling business in a public manner uh, in a virtual meeting has had to um, establish many kinds of rules. You have adopted the current edition uh, or the, of Robert's Rules of Order. So this is actually your parliamentary authority, some six, 700 pages. Um, over 90% of deliberative assemblies, including legislative bodies in the United States, use this manual. It is not the only manual. There are all kinds of manuals of parliamentary procedure. The original book is in the public domain. So um, if you want to get that original book, it's fine, but 
uh, it is no longer um, the uh, parliamentary parliamentary authority that you should be using, but it is in the public domain. But that's how we've arrived at Robert's Rules of Order, newly revised this book. The latest edition came out September 1st. And as I said, it includes a lot of information about virtual meetings and rules that should be established for their conduct. Robert's Rules of Order does not deal with outside of meeting events. It is strictly a book about procedure within a meeting. Any questions about that evolutionary process? If not, we'll move on. Robert Schulz is based on some um, upon rights. It's a very fair book. It's based upon the rights of the majority. Well, we've heard the term majority rules, and in many cases, majority does rule. But the majority is are the ones who get to decide what the action is going to be. A majority is required to approve items, and that decides what the organization, or in your case, the city of Mount Pleasant, what uh, area they're going to approve to go forward. It also is based on rights of the minority. Well, the minority didn't so-called win, but they have rights as well. They have the right to be heard. They have the right to speak and debate. They have the right to vote. All of those things are protections for the minority. Uh, they have to be notified when the meetings are going to be held. You as individual members, not only of the city commission, but of any other organization you belong to have rights as an individual member and we'll get into those. Um, absentees have rights. Well, they're not there, what rights do they have? Well, you send out a packet for your city commission meetings. You have the right and the public, in our case, the public has the right to know what is going to be handled at your meetings. And then when you put all of these together, you have to consider the rights of all of these together. So with rights come duties or obligations. You have the right to attend meetings. And we forget about that in the public sector because everyone can attend or anyone can attend a public meeting. Um, but you have the right to attend that meeting I'm, I'm not sure how many of you are in service organizations. I'm a Rotarian and I have the right to attend any Rotary meeting and I've actually attended your Rotary Club meeting in Mount Pleasant. Uh, I have the right to attend those meetings but I don't have the right to walk into a Alliance Club meeting or an Optimus Club meeting. Um, I have to be invited to those. But as a member of Rotary, I can attend those meetings. As a member, I have the right to receive the agenda and the background material so that I know what we're going to be discussing and I can get ready for the, um, the debate and the decisions that will be made at, at our meetings. I have the right to make a motion. Sometimes when we have face-to-face -face meetings and the audience sometimes thinks they have that right, but they don't. Only commissioners have the right to make motions. Staff members don't have that right, only commissioners. And in your case, the mayor as well. You have the right to speak and debate. And I could not find a limitation on your rights in to speak and debate. Roberts has some limitation. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. You have the right to vote. Only commissioners, members of the city commission, the mayor included, can vote. Others cannot vote. You have the right to nominate. You nominate those who might serve as your mayor or your vice mayor. You have the right to nominate those individuals and you have the right to hold those offices if elected. Those are all your rights of membership as a member of your city council, your city commission. You also have the obligation to attend meetings. When you took your oath of office to be a city commissioner, you said that you were going to serve to the best of your ability. I'm sure that that's somewhere kind of like those words are in your oath of office. 
that you're going to attend the many meetings, that you're going to, you should know and obey your rules. Knowing your rules is important and uh, following them is also important and making sure they're followed to uh, make sure that those rights of individuals and all members are enforced, to enforce those rules, to protect the rights. You have the obligation to further the object of your organization. Uh, whatever the city of Mount Pleasant stands for, this is what we're uh, all about. This is how we want to proceed. And this is the, the course we're going to take in order to meet those, those goals. And you have the obligation to fulfill assigned duties until properly excused. One of the objects of the National Association of Parliamentarians is to teach parliamentary procedure. So thank you for providing me this opportunity to fulfill that obligation I have to my own organization. The things to remember is, are that the organization itself is paramount as compared to the individual. You as a member can propose an idea and you can speak to it and you can vote for it, but it's what the organization itself as a whole decides that is of overriding importance and what will actually happen. Not what individuals want to happen, but what the majority of your commission wants to happen, not the individuals. All members are equal. No one gets two votes. Everybody gets one vote, right? Even the mayor gets a vote. That doesn't always happen. Depends on what kind of form of government you have. In your form of government, every member is equal. Every member uh, gets to have one vote. A quorum must be present to take valid action. In Michigan, in government, a quorum is almost always a majority of the membership. Um, don't fall into the um, definition of quorum that it has to be one more than half or 51%. It's simply more than half. What some people call a simple majority is simply more than half. Doesn't have to be one more than half. I had nine commissioners in Bay City Half of nine is four and a half. One more is five and a half. Do I round up? Do I drop the half? Do I tell one of them they're half there? None of the above. It's simply more than half. So what can we do in the absence of a quorum? Which sometimes happens in Michigan. Uh, we um, live in a state where sometimes uh, the weather uh, pre prevents us from attendance. Robert says there are four things that you can do in the absence of a quorum. You can fix the time to which to adjourn. That is, you can establish a day and time to continue this meeting to another day and time, anytime before your next regularly scheduled meeting. And of course you have to um, comply with notice requirements, postings uh, for that delayed meeting. But that would be setting an adjourned meeting. Perhaps there's something they can't wait for two weeks till we meet again. We need to do this sooner than that. So that those that are present can set the time for the next meeting, for the continuation of this meeting. We could simply adjourn. Nothing is going to happen because uh, we don't have a quorum, so we can't take any um, action, valid action. I hesitate, hesitate to say legal action, I'm not an attorney, but it is valid action that cannot be taken in the absence of a quorum. We could take a recess. Perhaps someone will be a little bit late or I talked to someone earlier in the day, they said they might, they might be able to be there, but they're gonna be a little bit late. Or we can take measures to obtain a quorum. Get on the phone, call someone. We were selling bonds and the bid was only good for one day. And so we had had a snowstorm and one of the commissioner's um, courts had not been plowed. We sent a snowplow to get him so that we had the quorum. We took measures 
to obtain that quorum. Now, if you slide that T over under the FAR, it makes a little different mnemonic. If you remember that one better, fine. If not, I like the idea of a farm. But those are the things you can do in the absence of a quorum. Often I'm asked, well, can't we talk about things? Sure, but you're gonna talk about them again when you have a quorum, when you have a regular meeting that can be called to order and where you can actually do business. The only time I would suggest that perhaps uh, you might wanna talk about something is if you have a special guest who's doing some kind of presentation and isn't able to come back again, you might do it that, you might do that. But other than that, I would say that you're basically wasting your time by discussing something when you're not in a regular meeting. Only one proposition can be under consideration. So only one main idea going more right back to the English parliament where they established that. So only one main idea. Now we can do a lot of things to that main idea. We can, we can change it, we can postpone it, we can um, send it to a committee, we can do all kinds of things to that one idea. But it's only that one main proposition that can be under consideration. Only one member can have the floor at a time. So in, in your case, you have some methodology of raising your hand, getting the attention of the presiding officer so that you will be able to speak. Um, in a regular meeting, Robert says that the presiding officer is standing. And when, <clears throat> excuse me, when you wish to address um, the organization, you stand, say Mr. President or Madam President or Mr. Mayor, whatever the case might be. Um, when I was in Calgary, I had to say, your worship the Lord Mayor, because that's what he was called and that's what he wanted to be called. Um, so you address the chair and then you are assigned the floor. It isn't an automatic. The uh, presiding officer really has the duty to assign who would be speaking next. Full debate is allowed on all questions, unless the rules don't allow debate. The general rule is this, you never debate anything about debate. So if you're going to close debate, it's undebatable. If you're going to limit debate, it's undebatable. If you're going to extend debate, it's undebatable. Anything regarding debate is not debatable. You either do it or you don't, but no discussing it. The issue, not the person, is always what is under consideration. Um, I recognize that we're all human and we all like some people more than we like others, or maybe they're, um, their beliefs align better with ours, or um, for some reason, we just don't get along with them. The, the problem is this, you, you cannot decide how you're going to address an issue based on who proposed it, or who speaks in favor of it, or who speaks against it. It's always about the issue itself, not who proposed it or not who's in favor of it. That's what is under consideration, is the issues that are facing your community and you as a city commission. A majority vote decides unless a greater percentage is required. Almost everything requires a majority vote. Um, and as I said before, majority is more than half. That's, that's a majority. It uh, doesn't have to be 51%, doesn't have to be one more, it's simply a majority. That greater percentage is two thirds. And the easy way to do two thirds is at least twice as many in favor as are opposed. You don't have to get out a calculator for it. And with seven commissioners, including the mayor and vice mayor, you know that a majority is four. But Two thirds vote is five to two because five is at least twice as many as two. Doesn't have to be more than or equal to. It just has to be twice as many in favor as are opposed. And that's an easy way to determine it. Um, when I serve as parliamentarian for large organizations and, and there's hundreds in favor and hundreds opposed, it's really easy to make that determination if I just double 
the negative number, if the positive number is higher, it got the two thirds vote. And we find that two thirds is required for things like uh, changing the bylaws in an organization, sometimes increasing dues, those kinds of things um, require something more than, than a majority vote. And lastly, silence gives consent. Um, if for some reason you decide not to vote on something um, and you abstain from voting, that abstention says, I acquiesce to whatever the majority decides. It's really an acquiescence. Uh, that silence gives consent. There's something called general consent or unanimous consent. And um, the, the mayor might say, if there's no objection, that amendment will be made. Your silence gives the consent to do that. So since there's no objection, then the amendment is adopted without actually there being a vote taken, but it's done by unanimous or general consent by that silence giving consent. Any questions to any of these areas? All right, moving on. A little bit about um, the hierarchy of rules. Obviously, we have to um, abide by federal law and state law. And state law includes um, your ability to hold these um, virtual meetings. Uh, it also includes things like the uh, Open Meetings Act, uh, Freedom of Information Act, those kinds of things. Um, so when the state law says it takes a two thirds vote to go into closed session, that's what it is. It takes priority over anything else that you might be doing. You have a city charter, which established your community and might be changed every now and then. But I see according to your seal, you were uh, established in 1889. So that's a good lengthy time that you've been a city in, as of Mount Pleasant. Um, you have some special rules of order including your code of ordinances. Um, you've adopted some things by resolution. So those are all, all of these things that I've mentioned supersede what's in Robert's Rules of Order. Robert's is not the first place you look, it's the last. If nothing else applies and you're in a meeting, then this is where you would look to see how do we handle this particular item of business. You also have custom. You do some things not by resolution or by code that I could find, but basically it's your custom how you do things. And that's fine as long as there's, um, as it is not uh, in contrary to Robert's Rules of Order. If someone points it out that it is, either you adopt it as a special rule or you drop it and follow Robert's. You still have that choice uh, as far as following custom. But again, the parliamentary authority, Robert's Rules of Order, newly revised, is not the first place you look. It's the last, if nothing else applies. Connie, I have a question for you. As you sure. watched the couple meetings of the city commission, yes. did you see any instances where you felt like we were using a custom that was maybe in conflict with Robert's Rules of Order? No. Um, the custom I saw was um, the... Um, your consent agenda, your consent calendar. Um, it's in your um, order for an agenda, but usually Robert says that in order to use a consent calendar, which is what he calls it, uh, you have to have a special rule of order that says who establishes that, uh, what can be on it, who can remove something, where is it on the, um, on the agenda? Is it in one place or is it intermixed? And where is it reported in the minutes? All of those items you already do, you've just not formally adopted it. That's your custom. Okay. Anything else at this time? Other than that, we'll get into handling a motion. So, the way business comes before you, you obviously have an agenda, but you start talking about something by someone making a motion. And I heard things like, I'd like to make a motion, 
and I think I'll make a motion that the operative words are I move. It's not, I'd like to, I think we should, maybe we ought to, so moved. It's I move, I propose, I suggest, this is what we do. Those are the operative words. I always had trouble with the verbiage because I'm not moving anywhere. I'm either sitting in place or I'm standing in place. I'm not moving. So why am I using that, that phrase? Well, in the English parliament, they have that table in the center. And when um, some, one of their um, members moved something, they physically moved it to that center table so that it could be discussed and handled. So that's where the terminology comes from. I move. And it's, it's, if you can think that it's virtually taking that item from the agenda and placing it before the city council, the city commission, I move that or I move to. Um, those are the operative words. If you have a resolution, the words I move are usually replaced by the words resolved that. The difference between a motion and a resolution is that replacement of that word, I move from resolved. A resolution is a motion in writing, which may or may not have a preamble. That is those whereas clauses, uh, which I like to say because, 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 now therefore be it resolved that. So many times you have that preamble uh, and um, the resolution would also go in the minutes. In, in total. What happens next? Another member seconds the motion by saying second or I second the motion. I did notice one thing that um, is done in your uh, community and that is your minutes do reflect the name of the seconder. Robert says that doesn't go in. I do not make an issue of that in local government. I think if that's your custom, that's just fine that you include the name of the seconder, that, that's fine. The trend in corporate America is not even to put the name of the motion, who made the motion in the minutes, because the action is of the total group, not of an individual who proposed it. But the other thing is, you do not have to be in support of a motion to second it. I can be adamantly opposed to something and second it so that we can talk about it and we can finally get it voted down. So I would suggest that in your minutes, the word supported by be changed to seconded by because it gives the illusion, which may be true or may not be, that someone was in agreement with that motion. The only agreement that they were in is the agreement to bring it forward. The purpose of a second is to let the presiding officer know that more than one person thinks this is a good idea and we should talk about it and vote on it. That's the purpose of a second. What happens if there's no second? It happens sometimes, right? <laughs> so what I hear sometimes from presiding officers is um, they, they can also ask, is there a second? Uh, in your mayor's case, he could actually second it himself if he chose to, doesn't have to, but should ask for a second. And then I usually hear uh, the motion dies for lack of support. I contend it never lived. That second gives it life. So it's much better to say if there's no second, after calling for it and an unwillingness to provide it yourself if you're the mayor, since there is no second, the motion will not be considered. Much clearer uh, than it died, some inanimate object died for lack of support. So I would suggest that if you're going, if that ever happens, that the verbiage you use is, since there is no second, the motion will not be considered. It's much clearer. And then you move on to the next item of business. What happens if perhaps there, we were excited about some item of business and someone started talking about it, um, but there really was no second. 
And now there are two dilemmas. The first dilemma is for the clerk. Who do I put in the minute, the second at that motion? And the second dilemma is the parking lot meeting that follows the meeting saying, you know, I don't think that action was valid because there was no second. Robert says the fact that there was no second at that point is immaterial and of no consequence. The person who talked about it after it was, the motion was made effectively seconded that motion because they said, I wanna talk about it. And they would said that by actually talking about it. So those two situations um, are handled in that manner. This step is usually missed by most uh, organizations, including local government. The chair states the question by saying, it is moved and seconded and repeats the motion. Um, it's the chair's duty to let the assembly know what is being considered. Because as we know, the only thing that can be taught, discussed or debated is what is being considered by that motion. So this is an important step. When I make the motion, it belongs to me. When it's seconded, it's still my motion. Someone else said, yeah, I think we should talk about it too. But when it's stated by the chair, it now belongs to the entire assembly. It doesn't belong to me anymore. It belongs to the city commission, not to an individual. This is the step that gives it to the city council. At that point, then the members debate the motion. Uh, members first seek recognition, obtain the floor. They're called on uh, in, in a specific order perhaps, or uh, just so you know, there are some specific rules of debate. We'll go into some of those now. Oops, before we do that, what do you see? Can anyone tell me what they see in this picture? Anyone? Commissioner Ronan has his hand up. Go ahead. George, you're muted. Commissioner Alsager also has her hand up if you want to move to her. Yes. Well, just it depends on how precise you want to be. I could be very generic and say a bird. Yeah, it kind of looks like a parrot of some sort of a of, of very uh, pretty bird with very colorful plumage, right? Yes. Anyone see anything else? Any hands up? Um, Mayor Joseph has his hand up. Mayor Joseph. Uh, you could say that you see uh, what maybe is like a tree stump or a log. Right, that the bird is, looks like it's perched on, right? Sure. But the bird itself, does anyone see anything other than that colorful bird? Yeah, there's a... Uh... I've seen this before. I think it's, there's a lady there with her yes. hand. Red. Yes, there is. Um, up in the, um, where you see the head, uh, you can see that part of her face is painted red and part is white. She has that, what looks like plumage over her head is actually her arm in red with her hand going down. She has one leg up. Uh, and one leg down. Okay, do you see it? And I, and I bring this because everybody brings a different perspective. We might all see one thing, but sometimes somebody else sees something different. It, neither one is wrong. I apologize. But, but you see that in debate, it's important that you listen to both ideas or more than one idea. 
that that is something that you, some people see it this way, other people see it a different way, but they're both there if we look for them. And so it's important to listen to those in debate. Okay. So decorum in debate. Remarks are to be confined to the merits of the pending question. And I know I did hear uh, Mayor Joseph uh, talk about this when I listened to a meeting um, that had an amendment on one of the, the motions. And um, he cautioned the members that they were only to talk about, at that point, the amendment and not about the motion itself. And that's appropriate. It's whatever the pending question is. So we have a main motion and then we have the pending question for the amendment and that's all that could be talked about. Roberts wants people to play nice. You're not supposed to attack the motives of another, even if silently you think they have some other reason for what they're doing. It's not the place to do it in a public meeting. All remarks are to be addressed to or through the chair. Through the chair, could the city manager provide? Through the chair, would the finance director provide? Through the chair, could the previous speaker explain? Members are not to speak directly to one another. Everything goes through that, um, that presiding officer, in your case, the mayor. So there's not, you don't get into a back and forth between two members. It's actually those um, members uh, are addressing everyone, not just a particular member that they're talking to on the city commission. And no member may ad comment adversely on any prior act that's not pending. You know, if they hadn't been so dumb 10 years ago, we wouldn't be in this situation, right? You might think that, you might say it privately, but you sure don't say it in the meeting, okay? So the rules governing debate are, some of them are this. The maker of the motion is entitled to speak first in debate. They do not have to, but if they wish to, they may speak first. Um, it only makes sense that if I propose something, if I'm in agreement with something that's on the agenda, that I might have something to say about it. I don't have to speak first, but I may if I choose to. Um, Robert says no one may speak more than twice to the same question on the same day. You don't follow that. That's your custom, and I'll get into that a little bit later in the presentation. But according to Robert, no one can speak more than twice to the same question on the same day. So if you have a motion, you can speak twice to that. If you have an amendment, you can speak twice to the amendment. If you have a motion to send to a committee, that same motion, you can speak twice to that. On each debatable motion, you can speak twice. But no member is entitled to speak a second time while any other member wishes to make a first speech, no matter how many times you get to speak. I call this kindergarten rules, you know? We learned this. Um, I loved to go down the slide when I was much younger. And um, when you went down the slide, you got at the end of the line before you could go down again. So everyone in line got to go down the first time before I got to go down the second time. It's the same thing in your meetings. Nobody has the right to speak the second time until anybody who wishes to make that first speech has had that opportunity. And again, Robert says, having obtained the floor, a member may speak for 10 minutes, which is a whole lot less than the hour that they give in the House of Representatives. But um, we're not that kind of system. Um, you do not enforce this rule. You are operating uh, um, as a small board, which is your custom now. You've not formally adopted it, but it is your custom that you can speak as many times as you can obtain the floor after everyone has spoken at least once who wishes to. You have no right to transfer your debate to another member. You know, um, I see, I yield to the senator from the great state of Michigan. You know, you hear that if you watch C-SPAN, um, but those rights are not transferable in ordinary societies um, governed by Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, the chair, that is the mayor, should alternate debate between the affirmative and the negative positions. So if something um, is controversial or you, you think 
might be um, not a unanimous vote. If someone speaks in favor, probably that person who um, offered the motion in the first place, someone else, uh, the mayor could ask, is there anyone wishing to speak in the negative? Don't have to, but at least ask so that it alternates between pro and con. Um, the important thing to remember is that you shouldn't talk of something to death. If everyone is wanting to speak in the affirmative, why are you gonna keep talking about it? If you're all in agreement that this is what we wanna do, vote on it. You don't have to all have something to say. And there's nothing worse than when I'm in a meeting and they go around the table and ask everybody to say something. And I'm the last one to contribute. And by then everything I wanted to say has already been said. So I'm kind of put on the spot. So it isn't necessary to do that, but it is um, a good idea to alternate pro and con. Nothing wrong with four or five or even all seven of you speaking in favor of something, but I wouldn't give it a lot of time um, because you're all in agreement anyway. Um, the chair though may not close debate without the consent of the assembly. So even though the chair thought, wow, they've really talked this to death, I think I'll close debate, we'll just vote on this. No, so long as anyone wishes to speak in debate, it's only the commission itself by a two thirds vote can close debate. Remember we said speaking in debate is a right of membership. Anytime you're going to infringe on a right of membership, it takes something more than a majority. And in this case, it takes a two thirds vote. So a motion to close debate Sometimes people just say question or I call the question uh, and that's a motion to stop debate. But it takes a second and it takes a two thirds vote, not just because someone knows the magic word to use to close debate. And all of a sudden this um, equality is gone because one person knew the right word to say. No, it takes two thirds in the affirmative to close debate if anyone is in opposition. If you um, made the motion, you're not allowed to speak against it. It's just something that Robert says is just don't make a motion if, you, if you're not in, and if you do make a motion and you're not in favor of it, don't talk about it. We have a situation in our community where um, we're, we're on the Saginaw River and the county um, got riparian rights to um, the river for a boat launch. Um, and so they asked that the city put in the infrastructure to get to, because it was city owned property, to get to that part of the, of the riverfront for the boat launch. As you know, infrastructure is very expensive and they had a grant for the boat launch and wanted us to pay for the infrastructure to get to it. So one of the city commissioners moved to approve the request, did not speak against it, but the vote was zero in favor and nine opposed. They sent a message to the county that, no, that's not going to work that way. And they went into negotiations and there's a very nice boat launch that is near anyone um, here that knows we have the Edmund Fitzgerald docked in the Saginaw River here, um, uh, kind of a, uh, and homage to the uh, Defoe shipbuilding that used to be here. Um, but that boat launch is right next to that area. And the city and county paid for that infrastructure to get to that uh, boat launch for the riparian rights. So it's possible to send a message by voting something down totally, but you cannot speak against it. You can only vote against it. So when a roll call vote is being taken, no interruption is permitted. And I did see this. And it was a question about making sure the individual knew what was being voted on. The time to do that is before you start the roll call. So if in your mind as a commissioner, you have any doubt about exactly what are we voting on, the time to ask that is before the roll call begins, okay? Um, it's simple to be the mayor says, well, the clerk called the roll 
And at that point, before it started, you can ask your question. Exactly could you explain? Because really, the mayor should be saying exactly what you're voting on. And you shouldn't have to answer that question. Um, but it cannot, a roll call vote can't be interrupted. You have no right to explain your vote during a roll call vote because that's basically debate. If you're going to, if you have reasons to vote against something, um, you can explain that during the debate section. Uh, in your rules, if you have some pecuniary interest in, um, in what is happening and you have, uh, you would in some way benefit that all the other commissioners would not benefit from that action. You can recuse yourself or uh, define that you have a conflict of interest uh, and then you wouldn't be voting on it. And you would also wouldn't be talking about it. Uh, you make that declaration, whether you recuse yourself or not uh, would be a matter of your custom, but it's not necessary so long as you don't speak about it or vote on it. You may change your vote up to the time the result is announced. So I hear the, uh, the um, clerk saying seven in favor, none opposed, or six in favor, one opposed, whatever, or unanimous. It's still up to the mayor to say what that means. Um, if, um, if you have, in our community, we had a rule that said you had to have five affirmative votes in order to pass something, five of the nine. So if there were seven numbers there and the vote was four to three, which is a majority of those present voting, it still didn't pass because there weren't five votes. So it was imperative that an explanation be made of what those numbers mean. And that's the job of the presiding officer. Motion adopted, motion carried, whatever verbiage, they all mean the same, passed, approved, adopted, carried, all mean the same thing. Doesn't matter which one you use. I would say just in your minutes, be consistent. And I know if everyone votes in favor, your minutes can reflect that it be unanimous. Uh, the chair then puts a question that is takes the vote. Here's where before the vote is taken, the, the chair, the mayor says, Here's what we're voting on. The question is on the adoption of the motion that. If it were a voice vote, viva voce, by the voice, then the mayor would say those in favor say aye, those opposed say no. You do it by roll call, which is the normal method of voting in governmental bodies because you answer to a constituency and your minutes reflect to that constituency how you voted on any number of topics. So there are a lot of different ways of voting or different terminology regarding voting. And I think that's on the next slide, yeah. So viva voce, by the voice, by a show of hands, as I mentioned, is done in Canada, by a rising vote. So Robert says that uh, normally, if we're in a regular meeting, um, those in favor would rise and then be seated. Those opposed would rise and be seated. And the rising vote would be the only way you could do a, a two thirds vote. There's no way that you could tell by a voice vote on the two thirds requirement that there were two yes votes for every no vote. It's just impossible to make that determination. Um, sometimes in a large assembly, there might be a counted vote. You use the roll call vote which is uh, appropriate. And I know that your, the uh, meetings that I observed, the clerk was, ra uh, was um, randomizing uh, the voting who was going to be voting first on each item. And it was the next person then would in alphabetical order would be the next one who would vote first on that next item. So that's the appropriate way to do it. Um, we talked a little bit about unanimous or general consent. So if, if there's a question if there's no objection, this is what we're going to do. And by unanimous or general consent, that, that's approved. It doesn't, just means no one bothered to object. A majority vote we talked about uh, uh, is a majority of more than half of those present voting. A plurality vote is where you have perhaps three candidates, much like we do in a primary election in August uh, for any number of county and national offices. 
um, where there are more than more than two, and then whoever gets the most votes goes on to the regular election. A two-thirds vote obviously um, is at least twice as many in favor as there are opposed, and a tie vote is a lost vote, and it's lost because it did not receive a majority. So those are the various um, voting terminology. And then the chair announces the result, which side has it, whether adopted or lost, the effect of the vote, and where applicable, the announcement, the next item of business. So it would be something like it was a voice vote. The ayes have it, the motion is adopted. We will do whatever was proposed and the next item of business is. Um, so when the uh, clerk announces the result, the chair would simply say, uh, the motion is adopted or the motion is lost and ask for the next item of business. Penny, I have a question for you on voting, please. Sure. This is Nancy. Um, if a member does not have a conflict of interest and therefore recuses themselves, we've always indicated to commissioners that they have an obligation to vote on every other matter that comes before them. Is that accurate? I agree, but the right of abstention is also a right of membership. But you're answering to your constituency. You know, if, if you don't vote on something, you're going to get more um, negative responses or tweets or email or whatever the case might be than if you voted um, the opposite of what some people want you to do. You're elected to make that decision. And I see a hand raised for Commissioner Toller. Yes, uh, Ms. D. Ford, I have a question on roll call voting. Sure. Uh, if you're a commissioner and it's an important item that you want to uh, request a roll call vote on it, what would be the correct procedure for proceeding with that? Would you have to get the rest of the board's approval? Uh, well, I would hope you can get it through unanimous consent. So if you had, I move that this, um, the vote on this be taken by roll call, um, it would need, uh, the, the mayor could say, is there any objection to taking this vote by roll call? If someone objects, now you're gonna vote on it and take some majority vote. If no one objects, if they give their silence, gives consent, then it's done by roll call at your suggestion. Thank you. You're welcome. So there's really six steps in handling that motion. Member makes the motion, another member seconds the motion, the chair states the question, you debate it, take the vote and announce the result. How many times should you have heard what that proposal is? By looking at that, how many times should you have heard the motion? Three. Okay. Anybody else have a different number in mind? How about four? I hear the motion when it's made, right? When it's stated by the chair, the chair should say it is moved and seconded and repeats the motion, right? When the vote is taken, the question is on the adoption of the motion that this is what we do, third time, and fourth, Motion is adopted and we will do whatever the case might be, whatever that motion is. So if it's done absolutely correctly, according to Robert's Rules of Order, it's four times. There should never be an occasion where you have to meet in the parking lot and say, what was it that we did with that? You know, Because if you heard it over and over and over again, then you know what that action was that you took. Okay, so different types of motions. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that goldenrod flyer that you were sent. So there are different kinds of motions. If you open, if you have that flyer with you and you open it up on the inside left-hand side, you're gonna see something that says ranking motions. So there are 13 ranking motions beginning the lowest is the main motion. That's what brings business before the assembly. Then you'll see uh, the heading subsidiary motions. Those assist in treating of the main motion. So to postpone indefinitely means to get rid of it for this meeting. 
to amend it, to change it, to commit a refer, to send to a committee, to refer it to staff, whatever the case might be, commit a refer. Postpone to a certain time or definitely to your next meeting, no longer than beyond your next regularly scheduled meeting. A limit or extend limits of debate. So um, everyone can only speak twice um, for this particular motion. Um, previous question is the motion to close debate. That is the question or I call the question or I move the previous question. It is to stop debate and amendment on the pending motion. And then to lay on the table to take up something immediately more important. And we'll talk a little bit about that one later. Those are the subsidiary motions. The privilege motions are of such high priority uh, that they deal with matters of immediate importance. So call for the orders of the day. And probably you've not heard that terminology, but sometimes um, in a meeting we um, skip over an item, inadvertently skip an item. And someone pops up and says, aren't we supposed to be on item whatever? Or did, didn't we skip an item? That's a call for the orders of the day. Your agenda are the orders of the day. And if you deviate from that agenda and you want to get back to it, that's the motion you make. And you can interrupt to make that one. Um, you raise a question of privilege. Uh, if you don't have all of the information that everyone else has, if you can't see, if you can't hear, those are all reasons to raise a question of privilege. It usually has to do with your ability to make an informed decision or your comfort level. We don't deal with that so much now because we're, we're not dealing with how warm it is or how cold it is because we're in our own homes or offices. Um, to recess, take a short break, to adjourn, actually adjourn the meeting, fix it. We talked about setting that adjourned meeting. Those all fall into a hierarchy of rules. So when you make a higher motion, nothing under it can be made. So if I move to postpone to the next meeting, it would not be in order to refer it to the, back to the city manager. It's a lower rank. We would have to deal with the postponement before we dealt with the motion to, uh, to commit or refer. And um, you'll notice that across the top, you'll see, can this motion interrupt? And if it can interrupt, it doesn't need a second. If it needs a second, it can't interrupt. Okay, those are always the opposite. Is it debatable? You'll notice that, as I talked about earlier, you know, Anything regarding debate to a limit or extend it or stop debate is um, undebatable. A lay on the table is undebatable because it is to take up something of immediate importance. Um, raising a question of privilege and call for the orders of the day, you can interrupt to make those so that those can be handled immediately and you don't have to wait. And then those other motions are seconded. None of the um, ranking motions uh, the privilege motions in that ranking motion structure are debatable. And then you can see if it's amendable, what vote is required to approve, and if it could be reconsidered. All of that information is on that little one handy dandy chart. On the opposite side, you'll see non-ranking motions. Uh, incidental motions relate to a parliamentary situation. Um, this would be, you know, with that, um, question about how to take the vote. That would be an incidental motion. You have to decide that before you actually take the vote. Decide how you're going to take the vote. Um, closed nominations, like when you're nominating for mayor. Um, maybe it's uh, uh, consider it by paragraph or seriatim if you're considering a resolution and you're not real sure about one of the whereas clauses and you want to talk about it separately. Um, create a blank is not done very frequently in local government, um, but it's to offer more than one, more than two suggestions. You know, you're, you can only have a primary and a secondary amendment. There's no tertiary amendments. So let's say you were deciding, maybe you were deciding when to have um, a special meeting and someone suggested May 1st, some, March 1st, someone suggested March 2nd, March 
3rd, but you thought March 2nd would be best. Now you can't do that because you already have two amendments. But if you create a blank, then you fill the blank with one of those suggestions and you can have innumerable number of suggestions. Um, division of the question, division of the assembly is when there's a voice vote to retake it by a rising vote or roll call vote. Uh, division of the question means if there are two parts that can be handled separately, um, this would divide them so you vote on them separately. Uh, object to consideration of question is something is so egregious that you don't even want your local paper to say you considered it or that it was offered, you can object to the, its consideration. And it, it, it just has to be made before any debate uh, is, is offered on the motion. Parliamentary inquiry is a request for information about procedure, about parliamentary procedure. Point of order, someone is saying some rule is being violated. And so if someone raises a point of order, the mayor would say, what is your point? And they would explain what rule they thought was being violated. And then the mayor has the obligation to rule on that, whether the point is well taken or not well taken. And if the person who raised the point of order doesn't agree, they can um, uh, go up to that very first one, appeal the chair's decision so that then the commission would decide if the mayor was right in his interpretation. Uh, reopen nomination polls, pretty self-explanatory. A request for information is information as to facts, not a parliamentary situation. Um, request for permission to withdraw a motion. If I made that motion and it was seconded and now during debate, I think, wow, that really wasn't a very good idea. I can request permission to withdraw it. And that can be done by unanimous consent or um, by a vote of majority allowing me to do so. Spend the rules. If you have uh, adopted rules uh, that provide for their own suspension, uh, you can suspend them for a certain purpose by two thirds vote. So incidental motions are kind of incidental to whatever business is happening. And the same um, that you'll find across the top, the same things, can it interrupt, does it need a second? It's debatable, all of those apply. But the thing with the incidental motions is they take priority because they have to be, they have to be taken care of as they happen. And then motions that bring a question again before the assembly, we call them bring back motions. Those are things like if you table something, the reciprocal motion is to take from the table. Uh, rescind or amend something previously adopted, discharge a committee and reconsider. Uh, your rule regarding reconsider is the same as in Roberts. It has to be done at the same meeting. So you are in concurrence with your parliamentary authority with that particular rule. All of those bring back motions um, are made when um, nothing else is under consideration. So it's kind of an, an, a nice little um, handout to have available to you if you have any question about, you know, is, would this be an order? Is it debatable? Those kinds of things. Um, I find it uh, a nice thing that I always have available to me. I, I kind of know them, but you know, at the spur of the moment, sometimes you have to take a look and make sure you're correct. So um, I hope that these will be beneficial to you. And on the very front, you'll see the hand, procedure for handling a motion just as we went through a little while ago. Um, the minutes are not, um, an example of a typical meeting would not be a meeting of a, a city a governmental body. It would be an ordinary association. But I hope that's helpful for you. <coughs> Excuse me. Any questions on any of those? And if not, we'll move on. So Roberts has some special rules regarding business and small boards. And he says it's not more than about a dozen. So I don't know if about a dozen is 13, like a baker's dozen or 15, 
but you're definitely under that amount, you're at seven, so you would fall under this classification. And business is handled as if in a committee. In a committee, you have a lot more freedom about how many times you can speak and debate, those kinds of things. The rules are relaxed. And you can choose which rules to use. You don't have to use all of them, but you can use which ones you think will be beneficial to you. In fact, you're already using some of them, even though you've not formally adopted them. And that's okay, this is now your custom. So the first one is that Members may raise a hand to obtain the floor before making motions or speaking in debate, which they can do while seated. You did that tonight. And you do that at your meetings. You don't have to stand up. You're you know, on a, at a table. Um, you're sitting before a microphone usually. You're not going to be standing to offer a motion or to speak in debate. You do that while you're seated. And so this is something that Robert says is allowable, that this is a good idea that can be done um, in your meetings and you are already doing it by your custom. Um, motions need not be seconded. You definitely do not use this one. You, you do the requirement that motions need, need to be seconded. The city, Bay City City Commission did use this one. Uh, motions were not seconded. If it was on the agenda, it was considered. Someone moved it, but no one had to second it. And so there was no opportunity. It was very limited what could be on that agenda. Um, and so they had some strict enforcement of rules like how did things get on the agenda to begin with that allowed them to, to do that. Uh, there's no limit to the number of times members can speak in, to a debatable question. You are already using that. There's no limit. Oh, you've already spoken twice, you know. Um, in the meetings that I observed, uh, members were able to um, speak and debate as many times as they wish to by obtaining the floor. So you're already using that one by your custom. Informal discussion of a subject is permitted while no motion is pending. I think this one is a bit dangerous. Um, I don't recommend that um, organizations use this one. If you have a motion, and you already have an agenda, so you know what items are going to be considered. It really focuses your attention on what is under consideration. And if you don't, if you allow discussion before you have that motion, it, it's a little more difficult to make sure that people are staying on topic. Uh, I did a presentation out uh, to Community in the Thumb, and this is how they wanted to do their business. They just had a general topic on their agenda and they wanted to talk about it and kind of refine it before they offered the motion. And it worked for them and they adopted this rule. So it really depends on what you're comfortable with. But the way you're operating, I think it's just fine. Uh, you have a motion and a second, it's required you have your agenda items. Um, I think it works well for you. And when a proposal is perfectly clear to all present, a vote can be taken without a motion having been introduced. Um, again, a little bit problematic for governing bodies. Um, unless you agree to something by unanimous consent, which is okay, um, actions are supposed to be approved by vote. But you can do it by unanimous consent and you don't have to do that show of hands. So I think you're not, by not doing this, you're just fine. The chairman need not rise while putting questions to a vote. You're doing this already. The mayor is not standing. Um, he is sitting in his chair. Um, I'm not sure what the arrangement is in the council chambers, but I'm sure that he's kind of in the center of things and is providing um, with a microphone as well as you. So he does not rise when putting questions to a vote. When I served as president of the National Association of Parliamentarians, Parliamentarians like to amend bylaws. They get great pleasure out of doing that kind of thing. And so we had a meetings um, four days out of five of our convention. And so during those meetings, I was standing. And when anyone wanted to speak, they had to go to a microphone and stand before the mic. If they were in a wheelchair, we made accommodations. But um, Robert's Rules was enforced in that very large assembly. And then if the chairman is a member, she or he may, without leaving the chair, speak in informal discussions and in debate and vote on all questions. And that is by your rule. 
you've already adopted this. This is how you handle your business. The mayor can speak. The mayor doesn't have to leave the chair in order to speak and debate <clears throat> and does vote. In some uh, municipalities that have a mayor uh, manager form of government, the mayor is a figurehead, does not um, vote, uh, but can only um, vote in the case of a tie or um, has to leave the chair, vacate the chair in order to speak and debate. So you do not operate under that system. So this is exactly the way you handle your business. So out of those seven rules, you have quite a few that you're already doing, you're using, and that's fine. So Connie, I have a question on that before you move on. Sure. If the commission wanted to use more of those small board rules or the commission has a custom that they've been doing that they no longer want to do and would prefer to follow Robert's rules of order, what's the best way to accomplish that? Is it best to have a resolution introduced? Yes, a resolution to amounts to a, yeah, a resolution amounts to a special rule of order. Okay. <clears throat> it's for the conduct of business. Okay. Yes. I also have a question. Um, I know, I don't know if you watch like, like, especially in our work sessions, um, there's not necessarily like a, a motion on the floor and we, we yeah. sort of engage in, we try to be focused, have focused conversation and sometimes, and I think this also happens in our regular meetings where, you know, we, we tried, I tried to, as chair, to try to like keep us focused and try to like still right. you know, recognize people as they raise their hands. There are times where people jump in and, and there is a little bit of back and forth. And, and so I guess if you observe that, you know, what what's your, you know, observation? Um, I would suggest that what, you know, what we're doing tonight is making sure that everyone understands the rules. And um, everyone is new at some point in time. Uh, and it's hard to come into a new situation. I think you have a new commissioner um, when you don't know exactly what, what the process is. So it's a good reminder um, that um, what I would say is this, uh, if, if it becomes a problem with people interrupting, I would say the mayor would may say the chair will remind members that assignment of the floor is the responsibility of the presiding officer. If you wish to speak and debate, raise your hand and you will be called on. I think a gentle reminder, but I don't think you need to do the reminder every time unless it becomes a problem. Does that help? Yep, it does, thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, so we're gonna talk about some commonly misunderstood motions. And one of those is amendment. <laughs> um, there are three ways to amend. Amend by inserting or adding, by striking out and by striking out and inserting. So inserting always goes somewhere in the middle. Adding is always at the end. So if you move to add whatever words you want to add, you don't have to say at the end. If you're going to put some words in between somewhere, then you're going to say where that's going to be. And then um, it's the duty of the presiding officer then after that amendment is moved and seconded to both repeat the amendment and say, if the amendment is adopted, the motion will read. So that everyone knows that if that's adopted, then this is what we're doing to it. Striking out words, getting rid of them, deleting, whatever you wanna call it, Roberts uses striking out, um, is just to eliminate some words, or to strike out and insert different words, or in the case of the paragraph, it's a substitute, but to strike out some words and insert others in their place. You can have, as I said, a primary amendment and a secondary amendment. There's no tertiary amendments. The secondary amendment can only amend the amendment. It can't amend a different part of the main motion. 
So if you have another area that you think needs to be changed, you would have to wait till you deal with the amendment you're, you're, that has been proposed and is being considered. And then when that's finalized, then you can move to amend a different portion of that same motion. And the only thing you talk about is what the amendment is under consideration. Yeah, that's another area where I think we as a board um, struggle sometimes because I think it's it's often sometimes where the discussion um, it that the discussion is not limited just to the the amendment and I'll and I think I'll try to remind members of that. Right. But then the, it just it sometimes it. It feels like maybe I should be more forceful and more. Um, you, know. you know, your commission is not any different than most others. And, and that's why I put, you know, in this misunderstood motion portion, I put amendments because it's misunderstood. I, you know, if we're amending something, I can't talk about that main idea. I can only talk about the proposed change. And that's hard to, hard to get in our heads, in our minds that that's what we have to do. So it's a slippery slope. So, you know, a gentle reminder, as you said, you know, just remember that we're, and I heard you say that during a meeting, a reminder that we're talking about the amendment and you repeated the amendment. And that's the appropriate thing to do. But Connie, isn't it true that it's not always just on the mayor to have to do that? Another member could say point of order, we should only be talking about the amendment. If it's a problem, yes. I am not a big um, proponent of points of order because they have to go in the minutes. Mm -hmm. And the chair then is now required to make a ruling. If the presiding officer can handle it, I think that's great. If the presiding officer is not handling it, then I would raise a point of order. But it wouldn't be the first step I would take. No. Again, you know, there's a requirement that all points of order be included in the minutes and the ruling of the chair on them. And I think that just kind of muddies up the minutes. Mm -hmm. But if there's a, a, what you feel is a, an egregious um, event happening and the mayor is not taking care of it to your way of thinking, then a point of order, or you can just raise a parliamentary inquiry. And that inquiry is, you know, um, is it in order to talk about other things besides the amendment? I thought that's all we were supposed to talk about. It's a much kinder way to get, get the same information across rather than doing a point of order, like pointing a finger at somebody that they're doing something wrong. So I think it can be done in a more civilized, um, kinder way, even if the mayor, you feel the mayor should be doing it and he's not, you can raise the parliamentary inquiry and ask about it. And that gets the information to the other members as well. Uh, one of the meetings I, um, I listened to, um, one of the members offered a friendly amendment. And actually it was done correctly Friendly amendments, you don't ever hear anybody say, I'd like to offer a, you know, an amend, an unfriendly amendment, or you know, I I, I want to make this so that it's bad, you know. They they don't say that. They couch the word amendment with the word friendly to make it more pal palatable. So it can only be made before the motion is stated. So when you make the motion, it's as I said, it's still your motion, right? And at that point, someone can suggest a friendly amendment to make it clearer what you might mean. And at that point, you have the, um, you can accept it and say, thank you, that I concur, that that is much better that way. Or you can refuse it. If you refuse it, that, mo that person can still offer that motion after it's stated by the chair, just as any other amendment requiring a second and a majority vote for approval. But in that 
short period of time after you've made the motion and it's been seconded, but before it's stated by the chair, that's the time for a friendly amendment. Okay. And next slide. Previous question or I call the question. Um, this is, as I said earlier, is a motion to close debate. Whoever makes this motion must have the floor. They have to have been recognized by the chair. Um, I call the question. It requires a second. It's not debatable and it requires a two thirds vote for adoption. Um, no one has the ability to take over the whole meeting and say, I've had enough. I don't want to hear any more debate. You can offer that as a motion to close debate, but you don't have the right because you, you know the magic words, uh, question, or I call the question. And sometimes I've seen presiding officers say, the question has been called. The vote will now be taken on. Wait a minute, time out. What happened to these equal rights? What happened to the fairness? It isn't just one person saying it. So this is the second most misused motion. The next one is the mis most misused motion. To table, on the table. This motion is supposed to be used to set aside whatever business is pending temporarily to take up something of immediate urgency. Any condition attached to it makes it a different motion. I move to table until the next meeting. That's a motion to postpone. I move to table until the developer brings in the plans. Refer it to staff to place it on the agenda when that happens. I move to table and we're gonna kill it this way. That's the motion to postpone indefinitely. Anytime you attach a condition to table, it makes it a different motion. So if someone moves to table or to lay on the table, um, the chair should ask for what reason, for what purpose does the member wish to lay the matter on the table? <laughs> Excuse me, too much talking. And if the um, uh, member says, well, I want to table it because um, we've, we've talked about this enough. We, we'll, we'll table it to the next meeting. We'll take it up again then. Well, the motion to table is not in order. Um, if you do table something, it's only on the table until your next regularly scheduled meeting. If you legitimately lay something on the table, um, perhaps you have, um, well, we used it when the, the um, president of the Michigan Municipal League was due to come into our uh, chamber during a meeting. And we didn't want to keep her waiting and they were in the middle of something. <coughs> Excuse me. So one of the commissioners moved to lay the pending matter on the table to take up something more important to greet our guest. And so they exchanged their niceties, she left, um, and then the reciprocal motion was used to take it from the table. That's the appropriate usage. This is one that goes back to the English parliament um, to table or to lay on the table. Uh, so if the monarch of the day, be it king or queen, would come into the chambers, they weren't going to be continue talking about whatever mundane topic they were on. They were going to uh, you know, uh, acknowledge this royalty in their midst you know, this is the person who could say off with your head and frequently did it. So they didn't want to mess with this person. So they would um, table something, lay it on the table temporarily. But there isn't a week that goes by that I don't read in the paper or hear on the news or the radio that some governmental body tabled something for the next meeting. It's just not the appropriate motion. They like it because it's high on that order of proceedings and it's not debatable and it only takes the majority vote. Okay, uh, reconsider your um, rules regarding reconsider are exactly as they should be. This is the motion that can only be taken up at the same meeting. Member must have voted on the prevailing side that is yes or I if it was adopted, no or nay if it failed. 
and after debate, a vote is first taken, should we reconsider the motion? In other words, should we erase the vote? Just get rid of the vote. And then if it, that's adopted, then the question is debated, can be amended, and then voted on again. So what the motion to reconsider is, is just to erase the vote and perhaps make, tweak it a little bit, make some changes, and then vote on it again during the same meeting. And exactly what Robert says. Uh, renewal <clears throat> is something we don't think much about, but it's a motion that has been made and disposed of without being adopted. And it can be renewed by any member because it becomes a substantially different question by a change in the wording, a change in the time or a change in the circumstance. So it could be something that was voted down at the last meeting, but it's some members feel it's so important, it comes back on the agenda and it's voted on again. Maybe the wording has changed. It is a change in time, might be a change in circumstances. Perhaps all of the commissioners weren't present the first time could be any one of those, but it is the same motion that was voted down at some point in the past that has now come back again. <clears throat> and I'll leave you with a, a quote from Henry Clay, uh, who actually ran for president of the United States five times, uh, never made it, um, but uh, he was a great orator uh, and a senator uh, from Kentucky. He said, government is a trust and the officers of the government are trustees and both the trust and the trustees are created for the benefit of the people. And that's what you're doing. You are in a position of trust from your constituents who have placed you in this position um, to benefit the community. And I applaud you for that time and effort it takes to do that and for your service. Uh, the only other thing I have is a little 10 question um, test your parliamentary procedure knowledge that you were provided. Anyone have a question about any one of these items? Um, I had a question before you go into this. Okay, sure. Um, one thing you said earlier was you mentioned presiding officer. And most of the time when you said it, I assumed you meant our mayor. That's correct. Okay, I just yeah. wanted because we also have the clerk who has to take care of the business. Right, but the clerk is the scribe, is, oh. is, the, is the secretary, the clerk, yeah. Very old okay. profession and a, a very noble one, I might say. Yes, well then the, the other thing area. is just, to, okay, yeah. the other thing is just a comment. When I um, first started attending and being on the commission, our habit for voting was saying I or nay. Mm -hmm. And you've said I or no. Correct. And since then we've kind of made it a little less formal, formal to yes and no. And that's Those fine. Are, they're all correct? Okay. They're all correct. Whatever all right, one you. you're comfortable with, whatever one is your custom and it's fine. Okay. If it's a voice vote, it's I and no. Oh, okay. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, um, I, I had a question about the renew motion. Okay. Yeah. Um, <coughs> there a vote to decide whether to deal with that. I mean, so if if you if someone moved for that, it did have to be a vote to decide whether to actually discuss it, right? I mean, you don't go right into discussing it. Is that correct? It would have to be on your agenda or to come up as new business in some manner because it wasn't approved. Right, yeah. right, so I'm just- I, I, I hate to give you the example, and, and this has nothing to do with Nancy, but in Bay City, they had a motion um, in December to extend the contract of the city manager and give him a raise, and it failed. In January, the same motion was made same amount of money, same extension of contract, and it failed. But they had one more vote. In February, the same motion came up and it was adopted. He got his extension of the contract, he got his raise, and in August they fired him. So, <laughs> but, it, but the renewal of that at each time was exactly the same as the original one that was first voted down and then they kept bringing it back. 
So I'm just, so it works like a regular motion then? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Mayor Joseph? Yeah, that raises a question for me because we have, we kind of have a strict rule for adding things to the agenda. Right. It requires five votes or two thirds. And so if someone was to re make a motion, make that motion, which I, you know, in my time on the commission, we've never had something like right. that happen. So if someone wanted it's not to- usual, but right. it's a possibility. Not in the instance I gave you an example of though. Sure. Sure, definitely. <laughs> um, but would we, I would almost treat that as like a new item on the agenda. And so I would it say. It really is because it's, there's a difference in time circumstances. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but right, the point is just because something failed once doesn't mean it can never come up again. That's yeah. the point. But yeah. to add it to the agenda, if it's not on the published agenda, to add it would require a motion, a second, and a two-thirds vote. Correct. And then when yeah. you got to it on the agenda, then you would vote on the renewed motion. Correct. And if, if that motion routinely would require a majority vote, then it would require the majority vote for approval. I know it's been a long time. I think we're right about at the 9 o'clock. Kenny, I think uh, Mike Homier had a question for you. Okay. He's got his hand up. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I just have a quick question. I, I have been, I, I practice in the area of municipal law. So I literally go to hundreds, if not thousands of meetings over the past 22 yeah. years. And I have never in my life seen a meeting adhere strictly to Robert's rules of order because every municipality is different, right? And they all have either custom yeah. um, or they, nobody, at least that I know of, takes the time to read 600 and some pages of Robert's Rules of Order. So, and I mean this, uh, just, I, I mean this respectfully. Like, for instance, I'll, I'll give you a, a question. Like, when you make a motion, but you can't speak against that motion, even if you're opposed and you plan to vote no. So what if you do? I mean, what is the repercussion from that, right? Because There's not going to be. Yeah. There's okay. not going to be. Yeah. It's just if you know that ahead of time. Um, in Alaska, the city clerk is by um, charter the parliamentarian for their city councils. You'll find um, they, they really have a strict enforcement. I'm not sure if you've been up there for meetings. <laughs> no. <laughs> they really do have strict enforcement. Um, when I became the city clerk uh, in the city, my predecessor gave me a whole three by five card and said, this is all you need to know <laughs> about parliamentary procedure. Well, I had a mayor who, I have a little cartoon that says, this meeting will be run according to Robert. I'm Robert. <laughs> okay. And I mean, the headlines were such that, you know, mayor and clerk tussle over rules. I mean, it was a big deal in Bay City for a while. Uh, and by charter, I was the parliamentarian for city council. So it was incumbent on me to become professionally registered to know what I was talking about. For them, it was a lot of fun to deal with the rules. It just depends on the personnel you're dealing with. And you're right, all the different councils are different. And I thought your meetings were very well done. I thought uh, the rules are, there's nothing wrong with your rules at all. Even the customs that you're using are in accordance with what um, everyone knows about, but I don't think it's a problem to know a little bit more about it. Um, not to point out that things are being done wrong, but to know for your own good, because we're all members of different organizations. And if I know I have that right as a member, it's going to carry forward to the other organizations to which I belong and that my membership, uh, I'm gonna make sure my membership rights are being observed too. I have uh, one more question if sure. you'll allow me. I had a strange situation recently where they have a rule that allows a motion for reconsideration to be done at the committee level. And that motion for reconsideration can be raised any time. So it wasn't time specific. You could bring that motion for reconsideration 
even at a subsequent meeting of the committee. And it had the usual that um, it must be made by a member who voted on the prevailing side. But the problem was during the meeting, we had one member leave. And so when they voted, it was four to four. The motion did not pass. Right. And then it's a su subsequent meeting. The member who had left was now in attendance. And so the question was raised. What do you do with that member if he wanted to make the motion for reconsideration? He was neither on the losing side nor on the prevailing side. And I looked at Robert's Rules of Order and there is mention of an absent member that could make that motion. Is that That's correct? correct? Okay. The rules um, for reconsideration are different in committee than they are in a regular um, assembly. And so it can be anyone uh, who even was not there who can uh, offer the motion to reconsider. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah. I deal so with your these. Your research was correct. Well, you, trust me, um, I, I've got the online version of Robert's Rule 12th <laughs> edition, but it is a painful read. <laughs> <laughs> if you have insomnia, it will cure you. <laughs> Penny, back to the true false test that you gave to the city commission for them to do. Can you yes. let them know what the answers are to that? No, I didn't yet. As a resource. I, I just wondered what if they had any question about any of the questions. If not, I'll tell you this. All of the answers are true. All of the answers are true. If you marked anything false, that's not correct. I want I want to leave you with something that you can use as a resource that all of these things are true. And if you ever have any questions or anything, if even your city attorney, uh, if uh, I can be of assistance in any manner, please don't hesitate to contact me. My email address is on the bottom and Nancy has my contact information. Um, it's been my pleasure to present for you. I hope that Maybe you glean something out of the whole thing, um, uh, even knowing that how well you do with what you're doing in your meetings. I applaud you for that. Thank you so much. Really, and it's very informative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you didn't think this two hours would be two hours all day. You did fly very quick. <laughs> now I'll go see how the basketball teams did tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Thank you. All right. Um, at this time, I'm going to pull up the agenda again just to. I think it's announcements. Yeah. Do we have any announcements or new business? All right, I don't see any hands, um, but I wanted to thank everybody on the commission for coming uh, to the meeting tonight and, and for Mike um, and, and for Connie's uh, help tonight and also our incoming new city clerk uh, for joining us tonight, as well as a reminder that we have a meeting with the planning commission on Thursday at 6 p.m. And I look forward to seeing most of you there. <laughs> Um, all right, without any other hands up, I will open up public comment on any city related uh, business. And if you're joining us, I'm assuming there's no one here. Yeah, there's no one on the Zoom meeting that isn't staff mayor. Nope. And um, did we have any emailed comments? Um, no, um, nope, there's no email comments that came in either. Okay, so I'll close public comment at this time for the night. And at 8.57, I will adjourn the meeting. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good night, everybody.